Welcome to Saleh Family Speaks. Hey, I'm Sana. And I'm Mohammed William. And we are the, the Saleh, Saleh Family. Family. We are social media influencers, content creators, and we own multiple online businesses. We seem to have a lot to say when it comes to just about anything. We are a mixed culture Muslim couple from Canada, and we're always asked about how our lives intertwine with the world around us. This podcast is all about learning to live, love, and laugh in a way that may have you rolling on the floor or throwing your phone at the wall. No topic is off the table, religion, culture, love life, and everything in between. So get ready and grab a big old cup of chai. Welcome back, everybody, to Saleh Family Speaks. In our last episode, episode 9, it was a TikTok Q&A. So if you haven't listened to that already, there's some uh, good information in there. And today's episode, episode 10, double digits. Can you believe it? Woohoo! This makes me so excited. We are actually mind blown at how many people from around the world listen to our podcast. It's incredible. We always get uh, messages on Instagram and TikTok and people saying how much they love the podcast. And it's very inspiring to help us keep motivated to keep on pushing forth a good message. Mm -hmm. That makes us really excited. And today's episode is super special uh, for many, many, many reasons. One being that it is all about a very hot topic. What is that hot topic, Will? Uh, The hot topic (laughs) is music and Islam and its permissibility or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. So in this episode, it is a lengthy episode, FYI, and there is a lot of academic information within it. So don't be dissuaded, don't be scared. Um, We did that for a reason, and we wanted to put forth the academic side of it rather than just saying something and not being able to give a reference as to who said Mm -hmm. it, et cetera, et cetera. Or the proofs, basically. The whole whole episode comes with proofs from a scholar um, that is well-versed in everything Islam. So... We, as Muslims, need to understand there is a difference of opinion regarding music. Unfortunately, we only ever get force-fed one opinion, and that is that music is not permissible. Mm -hmm. Especially on TikTok, you guys, there have been dozens of videos that are only one-sided about the opinion that music is not permissible. But no one has ever talked about the other side of it, so... Here we so are. in this episode, you will learn that there is no Quranic verse that explicitly forbids music. You will find that many of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, not only listened to music, but had musical instruments and played them themselves. You will hear in this episode how the great Mujdahid Imams um, had differing opinions, but had opinions that music was permissible, how you had massive scholars throughout history. Um, there's never been a consensus on this particular issue, and it comes down to an issue of ikhtilaf meaning a different opinion. And if you take one opinion, alhamdulillah, there's no problem. If you take the other opinion, alhamdulillah, there's no problem. The only problem is once we start to fight about it. By the way, you guys, if you're non-Muslim and you have no idea what he just said, alhamdulillah means praise be to God. Either either way, whether you're on this side or the other side, it's completely fine. Both opinions exist, but we need to acknowledge that both sides exist. And for the most part on social media, you only ever hear one side. So this is going to be an awesome podcast um, kind of explaining the other side of it. Yep, absolutely. So guys, stay tuned. Um, stay tuned till the end and you will really it will really open your eyes and your understanding um, to the different opinion. Uh, and I think that It is one that is needed in this world because, unfortunately, we only get, as I said, force-fed one side, which makes life very boring. Very boring. And if you guys have already um, watched our videos on TikTok or you've watched our YouTube videos, you've listened to our podcast, every single podcast episode starts off with a really awesome beat. Absolutely. So you probably already know that we take the opinion that music is permissible. And here's the reasons why. Um, We have a dear special guest on this podcast. He is a scholar of Islam, a dear friend of mine for almost a decade, and his name is Maulana Madhar Mahmoud, FYI. His first name is not Maulana, that is a title of religious scholar. So he was born and raised in Toronto. Imam Madhar Mahmoud studied the sciences of Al-Quran under the tutelage of his late father, Qari Mahmoud. He memorized the Quran and mastered various forms of recitations, and in 2012, Imam Madhar earned his master's degree with honors from Darulum Zakaria in South Africa. Ma Mother holds many prominent permissions in various Islamic disciplines and sciences from some of the greatest scholars of the modern world. 
He's the director of religious affairs at the Islamic Foundation of Piora and is a writer at the prestigious Mathaba Institute of Toronto. Imam Mathar is a member of the AMJA, which is also known as the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. And currently he is pursuing his PhD in Islamic jurisprudence and a license in cupping therapy. He's an active member of the interfaith community. He gives lectures at conferences, seminars, universities, in and out of North America, and he makes appearances in the media. And my favorite part is he's a close friend of mine. Mm. So this is episode 10 of Saleh Family Speaks. And we are welcoming Imam Madhar Mahmoud to discuss the ever prevalent and very controversial topic of music and Islam and its permissibility or lack of permissibility from a scholarly perspective, um, from the Quran, from the living tradition of the Prophet wasallam, up until the times of today. So we would like to thank our amazing guest, who this is now his second appearance, and most certainly a topic that will touch the hearts and minds of many people. So again, we'd like to welcome you and thank you so much for coming on. Mm -hmm. Shukran, Brother Muhammad, Sister Sana. It's a pleasure to be on. May Allah bless the both of you and continue to make you that the beacons of light oh, that you are. Alhamdulillah. And we would, we would indeed say the exact same to you. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uplift you and give you the ability to reach the masses of people of muslims and non-muslims mm -hmm. who are honestly suffering with their faith and their their understanding of life death and and spirituality in and of itself mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. i mean so I, mean, I would definitely i would like to to open this one up i think this is one of the most contentious issues that we see in the modern age amongst common people Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that we see because again it's always a back and forth you have and, and honestly it's interesting because there is such a dynamic you have people who say it's absolutely haram forbidden completely and absolutely then you have the people who say that it's 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 halal it's permissible with no exceptions and then you have so many differing views in between so i think that it's a great ops a great time to kind of sift out the information and see just kind of where that truth lies mm -hmm. and i want to kind of just explain like kind of our history so me being a born muslim um i've heard many things throughout my life uh, my parents are pakistani they follow the hanafi school of thought um, but also, I would say they're a little, not like rigid, but also a little bit more lenient. Um, so growing up, you know, I was able to watch my Disney shows and princess <laughs> shows and there was no issue, you know, with like singing songs <laughs> no. and things like that. So they were they were OK with it. But as I got older, um, I kind of was introduced to this more rigid opinion. Um, <laughs> she, means, she means when she met me. <laughs> basically. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> and, uh, we had our wedding and um, there was no music. Uh, mm -hmm. We, we ended up actually opting for a oh, couple, well. maybe like nasheeds that were just vocals only. But for me, it was a big change for me to embrace yeah. that. And actually for the first few years of our marriage, even throughout my pregnancy, mm -hmm. um, I, I was not listening to any music because I was of the opinion that it was completely not permissible. Um, so, but I would say mm -hmm. at the same time, music uh, prior to that, prior to you, William, <laughs> um, was a very relaxing thing for me. Like it was, I would listen to it when I would, you know, do my homework and it was relaxing and calming, classical. I was, I loved classical music stuff like that so anyway i this in there yeah. because i've lived both of it <laughs> and uh now i feel like our approach yeah. has changed a lot so mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I should and, and then brother yeah. muhammad ended up bringing back the music in your life yes <laughs> yeah crazy how he brought both hey? <laughs> and, and yeah to, to just yeah. touch on that uh for the people that don't know is obviously prior to me being muslim anything goes there was no obvious restriction to music um but when i became muslim um for the people who do or don't know is that my my indoctrination into islam was a very rigid one mm -hmm. and uh, alhamdulillah i'm absolutely grateful and and blessed to have been exposed to that just because from that i began yeah. to grow and understand and i really needed that Honestly, Structure, maybe. I, well, I needed that mm -hmm. that kind of strictness in my yeah. beginning, mm -hmm. and I feel like it was a blessing when it when it happened. But from that, Alhamdulillah. Um, so I, I obviously have have changed my my opinion through stepping away from the cultural dogma of certain groups of Muslims, mm -hmm. um, and I think that definitely plays an integral role. So I'm curious, uh, Sheikh, uh, from from your perspective, because you grew up in Canada. And you were obviously exposed yeah. to the Western lifestyle. So I think you're much more inept at explaining mm -hmm. music 
as per somebody who grew up in Saudi or yeah. something, you know? Yeah. F firstly, just to add that, look, Brother Muhammad, you mentioned your experience in the beginning. It mm -hmm. was one of rigidity, but I believe these experiences yes. are needed. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because what it takes you to, like what you are right now or who you are right now, you value that much mm -hmm. more, much more than as if uh, this, you know, uh, basically middle middle ground path or balanced view mm -hmm. that you take. If this was your default mm -hmm. originally, then you wouldn't have valued it as mm -hmm. much as you value it it's now. True. Definitely, yeah, I get it. I agree. And Subhanallah, this. And uh, you ask me uh, what my experience was. Uh, my experience mm -hmm. was with music. It's just, uh, it's sort of similar to Sister Senna's. We yeah. watch Disney <laughs> movies. You know, we listen to uh, yeah. Backstreet Spice Boys Girls. and. <laughs> You know, um, <laughs> Spice Girls, I was going to say that. And, and that was our upbringing, yeah. honestly. And my father, uh, Rahimahullah, being mm -hmm. an Islamic scholar, he would li literally mm -hmm. let this pass by. You know, he wouldn't give an if about anything if, so long as we were, you know, um, uh, you, so long as we were strict yeah. with our obligations, what yeah. we needed to do, that yeah. family life, and all these other things. And, uh, and, and that is the way mm -hmm. to approach it. Islam is not a religion mm -hmm. of rigidity or uh, harshness mm -hmm. and throughout this podcast we will learn that islam is so balanced when it comes to its view uh you know on music above many mm -hmm. other things so you know as brother muhammad described the way we understand concepts like music is through the book of allah first then the sunnah i.e the living tradition of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam what the sahaba radiyallahu anhum they resorted to what the tabi'un resorted to what the great imams mm -hmm. resorted to and what the scholars uh you know once again of that balanced approach what what the scholars of our time what they say in this mm -hmm. regard as well so yeah if you mm -hmm. wish to ask me yeah. questions uh, that that'll be great or if you want i can you know just sure, start yeah, with no, whatever i, think, I have i think inshallah. the first most important question that i would have is the sixth verse of Surah Al-Imran, or Surah, uh, um, yeah. where am I at here? Surah Luqman, sorry, um, is, is the verse that everyone yeah. turns to in order to justify music being haram. Um, and I find it interesting because yeah. you obviously know better than myself, and maybe you can kind of maybe make a point of it, is that what, what it, Allah has made haram is clear from the Quran uh, and, and the living tradition. Of course, um, of course. And, and when I read uh -huh. that verse of the Quran, and I, I always kind of look at it like, um, if you have the Quran, yeah, inshallah. So I was, I was, yeah, yeah. If you have the Quran and you place it in the lap of a Bedouin Arab, for example, knows nothing of Hadith, knows nothing of anything. If they were to sit and read those verses of the Quran, I find it very difficult to think that that's the assumption they would come up with. So if you could maybe just briefly kind of discuss why we take that approach to this particular verse of the Quran. We will, we will definitely get into these verses and inshallah explain the context of these verses which many people once again have mm -hmm. misunderstood and at times even misrepresented greatly. Uh, so just to start mm -hmm. off with from the Qur'an, we need to understand that it was the practice of the first generation. And when I say the first generation, I mean the companions and the fuqaha, the, the jurists mm -hmm. of the first generation. To always understand a hadith through the mm -hmm. light of the Qur'an. Unfortunately, this is where we have gone wrong today as an ummah. Where we try to understand, uh, you know, hadith individually or we make things hadith-centric. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some of my brothers and sisters will never ever mm -hmm. understand what I'm talking about because they have, they have blindly just, uh, you know, um, accepted this approach of being mm -hmm. hadith-centric. Even if even if that amounts to adding to the book of Allah, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it was never ever the practice of people like Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik to prefer any hadith over the Quran, rather any hadith may it be about blessings or prohibitions. They understood it mm -hmm. through the light of the Quran. So what does the Quran have to say with regards to, you know, the mm -hmm. blessings of the Almighty? So, for example, Allah says, in Surah 7, verse 32, Allah clearly says that 
قل من حرم زينة الله التي أخرج لعباده والطيبات من الرزق الله is giving a challenge to the people through the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah is saying that say O Prophet of Allah to the people that who has the audacity to make the beauty of Allah haram mm -hmm. right that beauty of Allah which Allah took out for his servants uh, who has the audacity to make pure mm -hmm. things haram, right? Mm -hmm. Pure provisions haram. Look at what Allah instructs the Prophet sallallahu to say next. Allah says that قُلْ هِيَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا خَالِصَةً يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Say, O Messenger of Allah, to the people that these blessings are for those who believe in this life before mm -hmm. the Day of Judgment. Mm -hmm. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies, clarifies his verses for people who mm -hmm. wish to learn, for people who wish to know the truth. So any hadith about prohibition will be looked at through the angle of this mm -hmm. verse. Is music for some people termed to be something Absolutely. beautiful? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course it is. Music that doesn't encompass vices, music that doesn't encompass... Yeah. Profanity, yeah. nudity, nudity, blasphemy, evil. Mm -hmm. This is beautiful. Or music in the back of a message about mm -hmm. sadaqah. Or a message about the oneness mm -hmm. of Allah. This is something mm -hmm. beautiful. Allah is asking in this verse mm -hmm. that who can make something like mm -hmm. that haram. And as we'll discuss, you know, the hadith uh, in relation to the music being haram, we'll, we'll, we'll understand them through these verses and we'll give a context to them as well. Uh, you know, as for the verses that uh, Brother Muhammad mentioned, the you know, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْتَرِي لَهُ الْحَدِيثِ لِيُضِلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ There are people who, you know, buy things of uh, lahu or a time, uh, you know, which waste mm -hmm. your time, and people interpret this to mm -hmm. be music. Uh, you know, the ayah in itself says لِيُضِلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ for the sake of misguiding mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me, if there's a music video which talks about helping yeah. people where's mm -hmm. the misguidance in that mm -hmm. you know and i want to mention something which i uh, uh which i came across and uh it, it you know it, i found it to be really awesome the scholars they say that if a person if a person is to buy the quran to misguide people with the quran then this individual would be part of this mm -hmm. verse as well for example, things like mm -hmm. David yeah. Wood. You know, David Wood has a copy of the Quran. They are using the Quran mm -hmm. to misguide people, mm -hmm. right? Anything that is utilized mm -hmm. to misguide people, may it be music, may it be your appearance, may it be the Quran in itself, that is mm -hmm. looked down upon. That is what is discouraged. Mm -hmm. Not music That's in what general. That's comes to mind, yeah. yeah. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. And and look what Allah tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to say to the people in another ayah. Surah Al-A'raf verse 33. Al-A'raf 33. Allah says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ رَبِّيَ الْفَوَاحِشِ I'll Say, O Prophet of Allah, that indeed my Lord makes vices mm -hmm. haram. What Allah makes haram is vile things, mm -hmm. you know, evil things. Now, if there's music which is not evil, how can you mm -hmm. make that haram? Once again, we're looking at these ahadith through the light of the Qur'an. When Allah describes the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 157, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the believers, they follow this, who is unlettered, right? He is found in the scriptures like the Torah and the Injil, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, occupation? What is the job description of this Prophet? He orders them towards goodness, you know, with kindness. Basically, this Prophet of Allah makes pure things halal for his ummah, and what he makes haram is evil. Now, mm -hmm. once again, we will look at the ahadith which prohibit music through, through verses like this. And subhanAllah, exceptionally, Allah mentions in this verse. It is the job of the Prophet ﷺ to relieve burden from Muslims. 
not add to their burden by making things which are halal haram look at the you know look at this verse brother muhammad and sister sana yada'u anhum israhum the prophet of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam relieves the burden of people doesn't mm-hmm. add to the burden of people unnecessarily. <laughs> yeah. Subhanallah. Yeah, this mm-hmm. is actually very mind-boggling for me. And look at what Allah says. Those who follow this prophet of Allah, who relieves the burden, who makes things easy for the people, who are they at the end of the day? They mm-hmm. are the successful. Ula'ika humul muflihun. They are the ones mm-hmm. who are successful. Um, so, so, so uh, uh, and once again, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At any time, inshallah. Okay. <laughs> inshallah. It's interesting. It's hard. It's like it's like watching a lecture. You're just kind of so mesmerized by it. <laughs> I do want. I do want to say. I do want to say one thing, though, brother. Yeah. Um, so, so one thing is like I grew up as not grew up. Sorry, I took social work in school. I have a bachelor's yeah. in social work, so I, I studied a lot about child development. Um, and one of the things that we learned in childhood development is music and how beneficial it is to so many different things when it comes to a, a child's brain development. Um, just just things about you know how it strengthens their emotional skills, their um, how their brains connect one side to the other, how their speech increases, how it develops you know motor and fine skills and and things like that. And then I think like are, are we depriving children of of never listening yeah, uh... to like you know. Uh, of course yeah. we are, because look, mm-hmm. the Sahaba in themselves and those who followed them, they, a lot of them were people who listened to music. And as we'll mention, in fact, it's mentioned about some of them that so-and-so is addicted to listen to listening to music. Inshallah, mm-hmm. when we sort of discuss uh, in the lives of the pious, you know, certain tabi'un, um, if you have time, of course. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no of problem. course. So, you know, going back to the verse, it is the job of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to relieve us of our burdens. Mm -hmm. And look at what Allah says at the end of the verse. Those who follow this messenger who invites with kindness, uh, you know, prevents what is harmful, relieves the burden of people. Those who follow this messenger, they will be successful. Mm -hmm. But those who go about and make things which Allah hasn't clearly made haram, those who harm people through their attitude, you know, just uh, take this topic of music, for example, when I was making my series, individuals have accused me left and right of things that really don't even, uh, really are not even supposed to be attri- attributed to me. Some of them mm-hmm. called me, Fira, some of them called me Qadiani, you know, some of them mm-hmm. were at my mother, oh my God. in their anticipation of saying music is haram. If this is what they're doing, what great, what what good are they doing? You know, That's so some of true. Them, mm-hmm. Honestly, you know, um, uh, like Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, there are people who are misguided on their path, but they think they're doing something good. Mm-hmm. So over here, in their anticipation of trying to tell me music is haram, they're swearing at my mother. You know, they're mm-hmm. calling me a kafir, and we know how bad that is uh, in our deen. You know. Mm-hmm. 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 So, yeah, you know, this is uh, basically um, what the Quran has to say in reference to the blessings of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah yeah, which is also, incredible. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just, I just wanted to interject just for a moment while you were on that topic. Sure. Still, um, is I find it, and because I, obviously I, I troll the comments as best I can just to, <laughs> to see what's going on, um, and and I see not only on on your videos um, but also on ours as well. Um, is people that the to justify music being haram they come up with the most incredible just fallacies lies so i remember one of them was that someone had said that there is absolutely zero benefit in music and that's why it should never you should never waste your time yeah and again like 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 sana had just mentioned there's absolutely benefit not only in the cognitive development of children but also yeah. in in the the easement of of your mind your soul um I, I, one of them i think on on one of yours today someone had said that that uh that about a particular artist that oh you would listen to that artist even if it was clean music and i'm thinking so now we're now we're just we're, we're if you don't like an artist then they're hot on <laughs> not not yeah. to do with the music um yeah. and the other thing was the whole music industry is is all satan worshipers so that's why we can't 
we can't listen to music. And I'm thinking, okay. subhanAllah, like, which tinfoil hat did we put on this morning that we're going to make an assumption that that everything is from the devil with this industry, we, even though, I mean, it's all, everything is all hearsay. There's no proof to back anything up that people say, and they, but they're using these to justify making something haram that Allah never did. Of course, of course. And this is the problem, Brother Muhammad, when we try to take such a rigid path, we make Muslims feel guilty about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not even make haram. We make them feel guilty that, oh, I'm listening to music, hence, uh, let me go into depression because I'm committing something haram. You know, we are opening the doors when we say music is haram. We are opening the doors of a lot of evil to unleash upon people who do listen to music. Uh, and then uh, some other people, they say that, uh, you know, some people say that, oh, why don't you listen to the Quran instead? And as we'll learn, the writer of the Quran, the one who was a scribe, Muawiyah radiallahu an, Zayd bin Thabit, they listen to music as well from time to time, you know? This episode is brought to you by Lala Hijabs, a handmade Canadian-based fresh hijab line offering some of the coolest and trendiest designs inspired by tie-dye. Lala Hijabs carries all of the things you will ever need for your hijab closet, including the softest jersey hijabs, rated nothing less than five stars, of course, to the strongest hijab magnets and everything in between. Check them out at lalahijabs.com. And be sure to use the coupon code Saleh Family Speaks for 10% off your first purchase. Look at what Allah says in the Quran. Allah created all the blessings in this world for you. Whenever Allah mentions verses like this, if there is nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to be haram as haram, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, doesn't say this specific thing is haram, for example, music, uh, as we're discussing, or there's no tradition of tawatur, you know, perpetual evidence that reaches us from the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that a certain thing is haram, then we cannot call that thing haram, right? Because mm-hmm. look, Allah also further clarifies in Surah Al-An'am, He says, وَقَدْ فَصَّلَ لَكُمْ مَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah has clarified to you what is haram. Allah has mm-hmm. clearly mentioned to you what is haram uh, and, and impermissible. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam further adds to this, in an authentic narration, this is mentioned in Hakim. He says, look, مَا أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ فِي كِتَابِهِ فَهُوَ حَلَالٌ Whatever Allah made halal in his book is halal. وَمَا حَرَّمَ فَهُوَ حَرَامٌ And whatever Allah has made haram, then this is haram. وَمَا سَكَتَ عَنْهُ فَهُوَ عَفْرٌ Whatever Allah did not mention as halal or haram, then this is automatically forgiven. فَقْبَلُوا مِنَ اللَّهِ Accept this well wishing this protection, this goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Look at what the Prophet says. Allah will never ever forget to mention anything. If something was haram, mm-hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have mentioned it in the book. And then the Prophet recited the verse in Surah Maryam. Your Lord does not forget. Right? So mm. your Lord does not forget. Um, you know, I haven't gone into the hadith uh, of a hadith of prohibition in my series as of yet, but let's take the time to do this in your podcast if you give me permission, inshallah. Mm-hmm. I just have one question in regards to um, what you've mentioned about um, because when people we tend to how do I say this? Uh, the verses of the Quran. Um, and what Allah is saying that how dare you make anything else haram that Allah didn't make haram, mm-hmm. to paraphrase. Um, so what then would be the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Could he then? I, I, I don't I don't mean to say this in a, in a wrong way, but um, not necessarily add something to the list of haram. Um, but because that seems to be where the the people come up with the opinion and is from the hadith, obviously, which is yeah. is misunderstood. But so- is that is that the case? 
No, so whatever the Prophet وسلم, would mention as haram, as I mentioned earlier, whatever the Prophet وسلم, would mention as haram would be looked at through the lens of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So for example, music with bad words, music with nudity, mm -hmm. because our topic is about music, these are the things which would be discouraged. However, the Prophet وسلم, would never ever make something haram, which Allah hasn't made haram. This mm -hmm. is not the job of the Prophet ﷺ. Look, Allah so, subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says that the job of the Prophet ﷺ is to remove burden from people as inspired by the Almighty upon him. Right? So this mm -hmm. is the job of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, for example, if the Prophet ﷺ is saying, you know, people will make music uh, halal, you know, although that, we'll, we'll talk about it, that narration in itself is debated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the authenticity of it is debated. If mm -hmm. it is Sahih, then the Prophet وسلم, is not talking about the beautiful aspects that Allah made halal. The Prophet وسلم, is not talking about, you know, music which motivates you to do good. Rather, the Prophet mm -hmm. وسلم, is, is talking about music now which is discouraged, you know, music which encompasses profanity, blasphemy, nudity, and, you know, all the above. Uh, and much more evils. That is what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about. And that, that is how the Sahaba understood the Prophet ﷺ as well. If it was not for, you know, if it was not for the Sahaba to understand the Prophet ﷺ in this likely manner, then the, the Sahaba themselves would have abandoned music in totality, which they didn't. As we'll, you know, get into some narrations. Um, uh, the, is, is that clear, Brother Muhammad? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So now, you know, people, what they do is they go on to mention certain uh, hadith and verses. Uh, the verse that you mentioned in Surah Luqman, verse 6, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that is such a common comment on my TikToks. Luqman, verse 6. Mm -hmm. Luqman, verse 6. Yes. Yes. I said, have you read the verse? Look, you know, <laughs> have you, you know, have you read Luqman, verse 6? What Allah actually mm -hmm. says. So the verse, you know, Allah says that those who those who buy or purchase things which waste waste time or things uh, of a you know unnecessary nature for the sake of misguiding people from the path of Allah without knowledge and taking it as a mockery. Now let me just give you a rational example. When I'm putting mm -hmm. music behind a video which talks about say the greatness of Allah am I taking that to be a mockery or am I misguiding people from the path of Allah or mm -hmm. am I taking it to uh, you know am I making this a means of uh, becoming a laughing stock or making Allah you know a laughing stock I'm not I'm trying to inspire people and this in itself is a clear proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about specific items here. And that is why Ibn Hazm says that, um, you know, people who interpret this verse to mean music, they have no solid evidence. This is what Ibn Hazm says. Mm -hmm. and, the re and the reason why is because nobody has the ability to make such an interpretation out of this verse except the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not deem music, uh, you know, as the interpretation of this verse. Meaning, music is something that misguides people. Mm -hmm. And th those Sahaba radiyallahu anhum who did interpret this uh, to be music, many other Sahaba radiyallahu anhum and Tabi'un went against that opinion. Right. And mm -hmm. once again, the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who say that Allah in this verse is talking about music, their interpretation or their words will also be looked at in light of the Qur'an, right? In light of Absolutely. the verses that we discussed in the past. This was, oh, Brother Muhammad, Sister Sana, this was the nature of the first generation. That mm -hmm. is why in basic, I'm telling you in basic Hanafi principles of fiqh that we study in university, we learned that, look, every single hadith should be looked at through the Qur'an. If the hadith is irreconcilable with the Qur'an, meaning you cannot reconcile the hadith, you cannot mm -hmm. add up, then, mm -hmm. then we will try to bring an interpretation about it. 
you know, uh, out of it. And even if this hadith, and even after we try our best to bring in, bring about an interpretation, right? Uh, and we cannot reconcile this hadith with the Quran, then we will reject it. This is a known fact. But unfortunately, what happens is, uh, as we grow up, as Muslims grow up, or as Muslims learn from, I don't know which source, um, TikTok. <laughs> yeah, maybe TikTok. They I'm learn so... that they learn that you have to blindly accept hadith, which is yes. which was never ever the situation among the first generations, mm-hmm. and that is why you know based on, um, you know based on this ayah. Uh, you know the ayah that they quote from Surah Luqman mm-hmm. Imam, uh, Imam Ibn Hazm says that وَلَوْ أَنَّ مْرَأً اشْتَرَى مُصْحَفًا لِيُضِلَّ بِهِ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَيَتَّخِذَ وَيَتَّخِذَهُ هُزْوَ لَكَانَ كَافِرًا That even if a person was to buy a Quran to misguide people from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take it to be a means of mockery as people like you know David would do mm-hmm. then this Individual is this individual would be the one who denies the verse of Allah. This individual would be the kafir. That's what he mm-hmm. says. So mm-hmm. it is it is the means that you use to either, you know, any means could be utilized to, you know, invite people towards Allah subhanahu wa taala or deviate them from the path of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Mm-hmm. Um, if music is used as as such to deviate people from goodness then one should not listen to it. But mm-hmm. one cannot go out and say now, okay, all music is haram. Mm-hmm. And this is the problem that I have with people on TikTok who make these blunt statements without yeah. any accountability. Yeah, and I want to I want to add something to that. Um, I feel like this like this particular statement can apply to so many different situations about deviating. So, um, for instance, me and William were talking about this the other day, but um, video games can also fall into that same category. There's people that sit in if front of able to use it yeah, as such, yeah yeah they sit they sit in front of a computer or a TV for hours at a time, missing their salah, not realizing what time it is, you know, missing their prayers. Um, and it's again, it's the same sort of thing. It's deviating yeah. you from your faith. So if it's not if it's if it's something that's not going to pull you away from your duties as a Muslim, then it's it's completely the opposite. Yeah, I find it interesting as well that that the people who who put and it's unfortunate, but when you search up, for example, online, um, Quran.com or whatever, they put in brackets uh, mm-hmm. in that verse music, right? They they, they put mm-hmm. it, so that's why common people when they're searching these things, they're like, oh, that's what it means, and I find it really interesting. Um, because like yeah. she said that if you were to use video games in that same sense, it would make way more sense than music because video of games are taking away hours and endless hours of your life. Whereas music, yes. you know, I mean, not too many people just put music on and that's it. They forget the world around them. But like video games are designed to make you forget the world around you. But nobody yeah. ever talks about, about those things. Right. So, yeah, it's an interesting parable. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that people don't understand is sometimes these people who translate the Quran or interpret the Quran, they, you know, as bitter as it may sound, they do it based on their culture, the culture mm-hmm. that's surrounding them mm-hmm. at that time. And that totally. is why, that is why in the principles of fatwa, we learn that the fatawa change from time to time, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, somebody asked Ibn Juraj, who was a scholar, um, you know, because he would allow music, somebody came up to him, and this is a comment that I get on TikTok as well. Uh, somebody asked him, How are you going to answer to Allah? Is this a good deed that you did, or is this a bad deed that you did, you know, promoting music? So look at what he said, very rationally. He said, it's neither a good deed nor a bad deed. It's something that is of a... Uh, 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 it's something that is from a nature of leisure. It's something that is mm-hmm. enjoyable, something that we naturally do. This is what he, you know, responded to that person by saying. So, um, Subhanallah, uh, you know, some scholars have even gone on to mention that when a person says Wallahi, you know, by Allah, mm-hmm. or takes mm-hmm. an oath by accident, Allah is not going to take them to task for that. So, why would Allah Subhanahu wa Taala take them? to task for something which is of a nature from, you know, something which is from uh, uh, like a leisure, t- something which is of a leisure type of thing. You get what I'm saying? Something which yep. is yep. done to uh, enjoy. You know, why would mm-hmm. Allah take people to task for that? Mm-hmm. 
and then uh, they go on many, you know, this is something that people mention oftentimes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only allowed leisure in three things when a husband plays with his wife, when uh, you ride a horse, you know, um, and a, a person who practices uh, archery, you know, and then yeah. they, 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 they quote this hadith and, they, and then they, they say that whatever besides this uh, is batil, not allowed, or it, mm -hmm. it is, uh, you know, horrendous. Yeah. So first of all, this hadith in itself is problematic, you know, and they quote a problematic hadith um, to sort of fulfill their agenda, which is, in my opinion, so, so deceptive, you know, Absolutely. this should never, ever be happening. It's an, it's an extreme interpretation. And, and when you look at, I mean, not to, to put this out there, but I mean, you look at groups like ISIS, it's the same principle. They take they take hadith to justify the horrendous actions that they're doing and committing in the yeah. name of, of Islam. Uh, I'm obviously not to that extent as them, but it's still kind of the same concept that, that we're taking these verses, we're taking these hadith and we're just, you know, kind of throwing our own ideas or interpretations or whatever out there. It's, I, it's, it's a very dangerous path. I, I find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other common, uh, commonly quoted hadith, uh, which I found probably at least a hundred times <laughs> in my comments, is uh, the hadith that, uh, you know, people from my ummah will make these things halal, you know, and among them, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned uh, music. Among them, he mentioned uh, uh, silk, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and then among them, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also mentioned uh, zina, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. And gold, yeah. I think, as well. I'm not, oh, yes. I'm not sure uh, if khamar, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Khamar, wine, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, not realizing that even this hadith, although it's in Sahih al-Bukhari, Imam Bukhari doesn't, did, did not record this hadith uh, as one which is founded on a solid chain of narration. And is that right? probably the reason why um, Ibn Hazim, as well as uh, Sheikh al-Albani, when he did his course. thing, declared it as being <laughs> not authentic? Um, yeah, that is why reason. Ibn Hazim, Ibn Arabi, uh, Alama Albani, you know, who is from that sort of Salafi background, yeah, they declare this hadith to be inauthentic. Uh, and mm -hmm. one of the people who are found in this hadith chain is uh, a person by the name of Hisham bin Ammar. And Hisham bin Ammar is known to be a Ta'if Rawi, you know, somebody who mm -hmm. narrates um, weak hadith. So, mm -hmm. wow, well, there uh, you go. This, I feel yeah, like there's a lot of there's a lot of people that that misunderstand what that means. They don't understand that there's a complete science behind narrators and chains of narrators and authentic hadith and what that means. They just read something yeah, on the internet and instantly they're like, "Oh, that's what it is." This I've got I've got to tell the whole world. You know, yeah. I have to I have to prove everyone wrong. <laughs> so. Subhanallah, my sister Sana. I tell people mm -hmm. all the time, you're mm -hmm. just looking the you're just looking at the icing on the cake. You haven't even seen the crumbs. I tell yes. people all the time. Yes. You haven't even seen the crumbs or the cookie bites which are found in the cake. Um, t uh, mm -hmm. Talking to them about, you know, giving them an example that when you look at a certain hadith and you make a blunt judgment, you're yeah. you're not looking at the backdrop, the background, the narrators, yeah. uh, why this hadith was said. Mm -hmm. You're not looking at all that. You're just looking at a very simple picture of that hadith. Mm -hmm. And the scholars, may Allah give them, you know, an amazement of reward. They have looked at these aspects. And, mm -hmm. and now you might say, well, you know, certain scholars do still call music haram based on, you know, based on these ahadith. And once again, I would say it's a misunderstanding on their part. Mm -hmm. If they, uh, and scholars do make mistakes at the end mm -hmm. of the day. Mm -hmm. Ulama do make mistakes And even as I mentioned to Brother Muhammad and Sister Sana Even if this hadith is sahih mm -hmm. We will look at it through The eyes of the Quran right? mm -hmm. Anything which is prov Provocative Anything which causes harm That is what is prohibited mm -hmm. And don't you see my fellow friends That the hadith mentions silk When mm -hmm. <laughs> the deen in itself has permitted silk for medical purposes it has permitted silk for for women you know women can you know enjoy that silk wear that awesome dress made out of silk the sahaba radiallahu anhum used silk in battle at times just to deflect you know the vision of the the enemies who were in front of them so that in itself is an evidence that you're not looking at this hadith properly 
Exactly. And then, since we're talking about hadith, people go on to quote the hadith of Nafi' um, about his teacher Ibn Umar. Nafi' relates from Ibn Umar radiallahu an, who is who's a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that uh, once they were walking and Ibn Umar heard uh, some music. So what he did was, um, you know, he put his fingers in his ears, and he told Nafi' that when this stops, tell me. You know, when this sound stops, do tell me. Mm-hmm. So Nafi' did exactly that. And then Ibn Umar radiallahu an went on to mention that a similar incident happened between the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I. And this is exactly what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told me to do. Mm-hmm. Now people quote this and say, oh look, Ibn Umar covered his ears. Oh, the Prophet covered his ears. Mm-hmm. Hence music is haram. Mm-hmm. But wait a minute. If music was haram, then wouldn't the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell Ibn Umar to cover his ears as well? Just as a safety measure? Or wouldn't Ibn Umar tell Nafi', you know, his blessed student, amazing scholar of Islam, you know, to cover his ears as well? Uh, just for the sake of, you know, uh, safety and just to take an extra precaution? But he didn't. Once again, this tells you that it was a matter of preference. If it mm-hmm. wasn't a matter of preference, then Ibn Umar radiallahu, you know, if it was something haram, then Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu wouldn't have picked up the flute that, that he found behind, uh, you know, a certain, you know, beside a certain companion, as as we'll talk about it, you know, as we'll talk about mm-hmm. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, at one occasion, he was with, uh, I believe, Abdullah uh, bin Zubayr radiallahu anhu, the great, you know, Sahabi of Mecca, the one who sacrificed loads for the sake of Allah and, 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 and the deen. And he found, um, a, I believe it was a harp, uh, as we'll discuss, Mizanun Shami, a Syrian harp beside um, Abdullah bin Zubair. And he picked it up and he, and he said that this is something which brings calmness to the intellect of people. This is what Ibn Umar said. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. once again, this hadith of Ibn Umar covering, um, uh, covering his ears, Scholars have criticized this hadith. Some have said this is a munkar hadith. Once again, something which is uh, fabricated. Imam Abu Dawood has stated this. But the interpretation that I'm, I'm giving is just in case people say, no, it is an authentic hadith. You know, mm-hmm. If people do say it's an authentic hadith, then this would be the interpretation because of other narrations that we find. Yeah. And we have to do this because you have to reconcile narrations by looking at other narrations as well. And not mm-hmm. just looking at uh, one single narration with, with a you know, simplistic view, if you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brother Muhammad, you have anything to add, inshallah? I think that it's, it's very interesting that, that we honestly even have to get to that point where, <laughs> where we, okay, there's, so there's no clear-cut, proof from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says music is haram um, that's that's evident mm-hmm. um, then we move to okay well is there are, are there any hadith that say where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said music is haram um, and then you say okay well um, like you mentioned like Ibn Hazim and, and Qadi Abu Bakr Ibn al-Arabi and the likes have stated that, that there isn't a single hadith about music that being haram or being uh, that, that that can be authentically attributed to the Prophet sallallahu mm-hmm. alaihi wasallam, like one hundred percent. Yeah, like so, no. So yeah, it, I find it just incredible that people don't take the time to to understand yeah. that. And but it, it's like it's like no, that's not enough. You have to give them more. No, that's not enough. And now you have, you talk about companions, you talk about the the imams. You talk <laughs> and about that is songs. why, yeah, and that is why I'm so forced to get into these things and even. <laughs> People don't want to understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, people say um, people say that music doesn't bring comfort to me, but that's that's fine. That's your opinion. But individuals mm-hmm. who wrote the Quran and listened to the Quran from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, music gave them comfort. Yeah, now, can you incredible. imagine mm-hmm. the ir- the irony? You know, it is. Mm-hmm. And and I've seen that, uh, and, and I find it I find it almost so sad that people would say that to say that well uh, and i've heard this that what benefit from music i benefit from the quran and i find that so disrespectful to people because 
Everyone takes benefit. Everyone loves to listen to the recitation. Of the Quran. Every, Absolutely. Everyone but to put, put people put themselves on such a level of, of piety that is almost unattainable by the human being and, and look yeah, down and, upon and, people. And mm -hmm. to say it like that is just mm -hmm. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And academically, you know, academically, scholar, at a scholarly level, this argument of theirs would be rejected in a minute. Why are you comparing a worship, right? The Quran, reciting the Quran. Why are you comparing that? With something of uh, which is from a uh, a perspective of leisure, something mm -hmm. which is of a you know a nature of leisure. Why are you comparing the two? You, there's no mm -hmm. comparison. You know, it's like you saying, "Oh, uh, oh, play." You know, I rather I rather read the Quran than play soccer. Okay, this has <laughs> playing soccer has its time, and reading reading the Quran has its time. You know, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, alhamdulillah, you know, at least we gone, we've we gone through some of the many ahadith people misquote, mm -hmm. uh, which is amazing. Um, yeah, another thing that people bring up, Brother Muhammad and Sister mm -hmm. Sana, is the majority minority <laughs> thing. Yes, yes, please, 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 let's speak on this topic because yeah. every, okay, here, the, the thing that really bothers me, so um, every time I go on TikTok, and I'm so, so incredibly happy that you're now on TikTok because TikTok really needs real scholars that are knowledgeable mm -hmm. about the deen because there's too many TikTok scholars that are using the word halal and haram. Like me and William have been on TikTok for, for quite a few months now, but you can scroll every single video of ours and you'll never, you never once hear us using Haram, but you'll find Amen. other accounts that throw those two words around like it's candy. Like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I am I am honestly surprised that how much this word is thrown around. The word haram. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't recall the name, but what among the pious predecessors, uh, I believe it was Sufyan Thauri. It is Sufyan Thauri. Yes, Sufyan Thauri said something very beautiful. He said that it is very easy to say haram, haram, haram. But true intellect is when a person could say that this is halal. Mm -hmm. you know, that is true wow. intellect. True yeah. intellect is to yeah. true intellect is to make things easy for people by deeming them halal and not mm -hmm. yeah, you know, and, throwing, yeah, throwing, yeah. and not throwing slurs uh, of using the word haram to deprive people of the blessings of Allah. This yes. is what Sufyan is doing. 100% I agree with that because if you if you scroll also, you'll scroll our comments, there are a lot of non-Muslims that follow us only because they want to yeah. learn more and they want to learn in, uh, like I guess you could say, like non-extreme non way. Yeah. They like to learn from just like a, an easy way to, to learn about Islam. And I think if they were to approach or even see these other accounts, they would be afraid and run the opposite way. I don't think they would ever want to learn more about Islam if they just heard, this is not permissible, this is not permissible, that's haram, that's yeah. haram. Yeah, what, what it, would would it would scare them. It would, would it Yeah, because all they see or all they would think of is, oh my God, my life would have so many yeah. restrictions. Yeah. They would never see <laughs> course, the good, yeah, they would never see the good side of it of what peace it brings to your life or how easy it is or how yeah. simple it is. And I find, uh, to interject on that point, is that like myself i knew nothing about islam before I, I just i felt that connection and i kind of jumped in in terms of nothing i mean like halal haram. Yes. i didn't even know what any of that meant yeah. um and when i see you know like like she's mentioning that that people don't even even muslims i mean we don't understand halal haram from a common perspective um, and i'm reminded and you can correct me if i'm wrong i believe it was imam malik um, who said, you know, that that he was very hesitant to issue a ruling of something being haram because he could always yeah. think of someone else who said that thing was halal and bring an opinion to, of to, course. to, to validate yeah. it. Uh, this, you're, this is something that you're mentioning on behalf of Imam Malik, but Brother Muhammad, this was the practice of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the first generation of scholars. Mm -hmm. People like Imam Abu Hanifa would have said the same things. Mm -hmm. And that is why, you know, unbelievably, we find narrations which call individuals like uh, Imam Abu Hanifa kafir, but he never ever responded to that, those slurs. And look at how Allah made him shine as the Imam of rationality, the Imam of reason. And uh, according to the majority of the world, you know, people like throwing this word majority, mm -hmm. according to majority of the world, he is called Al Imam Al A'zam, one of the greatest Imams or the greatest Imam. 
Um, and, and that does bring us to the majority minority issue. Look, yes. in fiqh, in fiqh, majority and minority, you know, these statements or these terms are fallacies. They are non existent. Mm -hmm. Something could be a majority today and a minority tomorrow. For example, at one point in time, believe it or not, it was the majority of, not the Sahaba, once again, the majority of scholars who would say that if a person does not pray salah, they, they should be beat, beaten. Mm -hmm. And some even said they should be killed. That is unheard of today. Why? Because it is something which goes against the message of Allah and His Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is not something that the living tradition promoted. At one point in time, Imam Abu Hanifa was a minority. You, mm -hmm. you don't have to go far, you know, you, you don't have to go far to see this. Open the book of uh, the son of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Abdullah, Kitab al-Sunnah. He brings loads of narration which allude to Imam Abu Hanifa being a kafir, not even a Muslim. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And look, you know, today, as I told Brother Muhammad earlier in a you know, WhatsApp message, we have a lot of WhatsApp messages back and forth. <laughs> I, told him, uh, I told him that, look, today, although the Hanafi madhab is not adequately represented by Hanafis, mm -hmm. but it is now the majority, right? In yes. terms of the yeah. Islamic school of thought. Yeah. Uh, another, another example where, um, you know, you cannot use majority as a dalil, uh, you know, a proof. At one point in time, Qaramita, the Qaramita, who was an extremist sect of Shia, by the way, no hate to Shias or anything, mm -hmm. but this was an Absolutely. extremist sect, sort of like ISIS, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they, they basically became the predominant majority in the area of the Haram. They, they overtook the Haram. In fact, the, the person who attacked the, the, the leader of the Qaramita, who attacked the Haram, actually said that, uh, you know, when, when he reached the Kaaba, he actually said, you know, where is the army of Allah to destroy me? <laughs> you know, he had the audacity mm -hmm. to say, where is the army of Allah to destroy me? Look how I took over the Haram. This is what he said. So now if you're talking about the majority being on the truth, then you would say, oh, okay, yeah, since the Qaramita were predominantly the majority or the majority in effect at that time who butchered Muslims, right, and who, who mm -hmm. took over the land of Allah, the Haram, who uh, destroyed the Hajar al-Aswad, you know, the black stone, then, yeah, they must be on the truth. Yeah. No one in their right mind would say that, <laughs> right? No one would in their right mind would say extremists are truthful just because they are the majority now. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yes. And subhanAllah, this, this verse in the Quran is so outstanding. You know, I res it resonates with me where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, Allah speaks about the majority now in the Quran. Allah says, If you are really to obey the majority, what they will end up doing is they will misguide you from the path of Allah. Subhanallah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what Allah says in the Quran. So Allah, Allah himself is sort of throwing at, out that possibility of following majority every single time. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And look at what Allah says. Uh, some of the times, it, what, what happens when he, people quote majority, Allah says, In yattabi'una illa dhan. Many a times, the majority that people try to follow, they are just following assumptions. The majority in themselves, they're following assumptions. Now, for instance, take this uh, issue of music. Brother Muhammad and Sister Sana, you will yes. never ever find the stuff that I mentioned to you. You know, the, the quotes about the Sahaba, the quotes mm -hmm. about like, for example, Ibn Hazm, at, at a large level, you will never ever find them to be translated into the English language. Why? Correct. Because... Because people want to bring a message of a, a cross based on their bias, based on their biases. And in turn, what do they end up doing? They end up, they end up committing such a great cheat in terms of knowledge. You know, they end up cheating knowledge. They, they end up hiding knowledge. That's what they end up doing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And then in, in turn, what happens? The, the, the masses are misguided, right? Look, I, I understand if an alim, a genuine scholar, looks at the topic of music, looks at the ahadith, looks at the narrations, and through their logical deduction, the, this alim, you know, 
this scholar says that music is haram. I believe this person will be rewarded, but I don't say the same about blind followers who instigate, who hurl threats, you know, who call music haram based on their blind following. I don't say the same about them. They will not be rewarded. In fact, they will be taken to an account for misguiding people uh, by using the word haram. And not only that, they will be taken uh, you know, into account for the slurs that they throw in their anticipation of making something haram, right? Mm -hmm. So they, which, I find, what, which I find, sorry to, to jump on that, but which I find absolutely incredible that people would sin to such an extent of calling uh, someone else a kafir because they, they approve uh, or they, they don't deem music to be haram. They would sin to such an extent as to something like that over something that is a difference of opinion. I, I, yeah. I, it's to me, it's like, you know, you're, like you're going to justify murdering someone because uh, they like the color orange. I mean, it just is so ridiculously illogical. And it, but you know, at the same time, um, I believe it was Aristotle. I could I could be wrong. Plato or Aristotle, and and when, he said that the person who loses the debate is the first person to insult the other person. And that's yeah, honestly. And when you see that, um, that people who say, okay, music, is, this is the proofs, evidence, of so on and so forth, automatically the people attack and they, they just turn yeah. into attack mode. But when someone says music is haram, it's, oh, mashallah, mashallah. And it's, it's mind boggling like, to me. It's mind boggling. Uh, you know, this, uh, this example of Aristotle that you described, I had a back and forth with one person on, on TikTok mm -hmm. and uh, I, I mentioned my proofs and evidences in the most kindest and most honorable uh you know possible ways and because they couldn't handle the truth they tried to cancel me out by saying oh you know i asked certain ulama about madhar and they say that take whatever he says with a a pinch of salt yes you know, just cancel the person out because yes. you have no adequate response mm -hmm. uh, which really hurt me at that moment but then once again i thought to myself that greater people than me like i mentioned the likes of malik and abu hanifa Forget about, you know, even these great imams, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was, you know, he, he, people tried to cancel even the Prophet out mm -hmm. because he was trying to do something good, you know? Um, so, uh, as we briefly explained that majority and minority have no value in, in the deen, especially when it comes to matters of fiqh. Today, mm -hmm. something could be a majority and tomorrow, um, you know, something could be a, a minority. And sure. by the way, we discussed this topic among 400 scholars, uh, plus 400 plus scholars in a, in a very intense session at Amja. And they, you know, all these ulama who were presenting said that, yeah, you know, majority and minority and fiqh are just terms that mm -hmm. people throw around. Nothing more than that. I find it incredible. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, one thing that, uh, someone had commented that I, that I read and they said, well, um, a majority opinion could never turn into a minority opinion because it's taught. So that's why a majority will always remain a majority. But then I was reminded um, of Sheikh Adebek Shukurov. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, yeah. but, you know, I listened yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to one of his lectures and he, he said such a, a brilliant thing. And that was that the problem with. Um, and I think he was speaking about uh, mortgages and how, why, in his view, that they're yeah. permissible. Um, and he said, you know, that the reason these things are deemed as being haram or whatever is not because that's what they are, um, but it's because of the people. So, for example, someone goes to an institution to learn, and rather than saying uh, that this thing, why is this thing haram versus halal, and research the topic. Uh, without a bias to come to a conclusion, they go at it as this thing is haram because. So they're only looking for information to validate the claim and, and their understanding that they already have. So they go into exactly. academic studies with such a bias that it really it really makes it difficult for anybody to have. I mean, you have to have an open yeah. mind when it comes to learning, which I find is is almost it's not that it's unheard of, but it's, it's almost the, the minority approach, if you will, to, to academic learning. Yeah, so so you know, in in layman terms, in, in simple words, what you're basically trying to say is, you know, before researching the the topic, they're already convinced that something is haram. Absolutely right.
and then they just try, try to substantiate uh, their claim, their initial claim that so and so thing is haram, and hence all the proofs that I'm going to try to bring about, they will be uh, of a nature of prohibition and not exactly. of a nature of permissibility. Correct? Exactly. Absolutely correct. Yeah, I, and Subhanallah, you know, um, even if you look at modern day scholars, people mm -hmm. like Sheikh Salman Al Auda, the great giant scholar uh, of Saudi Arabia, I would say that. If we are to give him any title, he is like the Malik of our time or Abu Hanifa of our time. And re re regrettably, he's in prison, you know. But so were they. But so were they. So was Imam Abu Allah Hanifa, Allah. Imam Malik, oh, yeah. Imam Ahmed, subhanAllah. Yeah. So he's in good company. Uh, <laughs> yeah, regrettably, he's, he's imprisoned by the Saudi regime who sees him to be a threat because the youth were being so attracted to him, mm -hmm. his message and his guidance. Uh, Sheikh Salman al Auda allows music. You know, mm -hmm. a person of his caliber who's written multiple books on fiqh, mm -hmm. he would not allow music just like that. Uh, and he actually has has two brilliant series uh, on YouTube, which I believe are uh, which which I believe have English subtitles. One is Wasm al Auda, which is the mark of al Auda, where he describes, you know, various simple topics. Uh, Psychologically, for the benefit of, of of Muslims, for example, saying sorry, how how amazing that is! Just to say sorry, uh, he speaks about his wife in one, and then the other video series that he has is uh, the philosophy of Adam alayhi salam, which is oh my god, mind blowing, and you know, ironically, both of these series have music in the background. <laughs> you know, they have music in the background, and then. You know, people quote, uh, you know, sort of the individuals from the Salafi background. They say, oh, have you heard of Sheikh Salman al Auda?" Mm -hmm. I just grin and I say, he's my teacher. And, <laughs> and just, just, just check out two of these series in order to get an idea of who Salman al Auda is. Mm -hmm. uh, another Saudi scholar, which is, you know, who I, I'm not really fond of when it comes to his political views. He's very uh, in line with uh, the government. Right. He says something beautiful. You know, we learn in Islam that. You know, خذ ما صفا ودع ما كدر. Take something, you know, take something which is clean from people and leave what is dirty. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't agree with his politics, but he said something very beautiful in terms of uh, music. He said that لو كان الغناء حراما لذكره الله بالزنا والربا. That if music was haram, Allah would have clearly stated it was haram side by side with zina, with fornication and usury. But Allah didn't. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, I found to be very, very amazing. You know, other scholars, Dar al Ifta al al, -al Masriya, mm -hmm. uh, Sheikh Jad, you know, the Grand Mufti of Azhar who passed away, mm -hmm. uh, Sheikh Sha'rawi, the great Mufassir of the Quran, the great exegist of the Quran. Uh, you know, people like, uh, once again, Salih al Maghamisi, Sheikh Jad, uh, not only Dar al Ifta al Masriya, but even the Dar al Ifta of Palestine. You know, they allow music so long as there's nothing bad with the lyrics. Um, and uh, the other great imam of our time who's who's looked up to by, by thousands and hundreds of people, Sheikh Qardawi. Sheikh Qardawi says so long as there's nothing wrong with the lyrics, go ahead, you know, listen to that music. Mm -hmm. So oh. these are just uh, some of the many scholars of our time. And I can name other, uh, I don't want to get you bored, but I can name <laughs> <Yeah>. other hundreds, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of scholars and, and in this our is, time. This is the, the amazing thing is that... You know, like you said, that you I mean you could spend a long time naming all these companions and scholars and all this sort of stuff, and then and then to have people on TikTok say that the majority opinion is music is absolutely haram. I I, I just that's yeah, that's very foolish. Very, very and, and I also, and then they say that no, the majority ahead. of the Sahaba believed it's haram. Yes. That video actually hurt me, mm -hmm. and the brother still didn't respond to me. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully, I will discuss. Many of the Sahaba, if you give me time, Brother Muhammad and Sister Sana, mm -hmm. I'll discuss some of the some of the Sahaba who loved music, who enjoyed music. If you give me permission, once again, <laughs> absolutely, I'm always always free to to speak. Or or if I'm not taking too much of your time, please, no, you know, no, that's uh, okay. do that's interject. Okay. Um, one thing I would like to to maybe just briefly touch on is is as as a Muslim, right? Because as you will find that this is not. Uh, necessarily an argument for the ulama because I, I at least the scholars that I know and I trust and I, and I 
they have the understanding that this is not, I mean, there is an ikhtilaf, there is a difference of opinion, yeah. uh, which we accept, alhamdulillah, is fine, no problem. But the whole point of this is to show that it's not, it, it, the difference of opinion um, isn't, it doesn't give you the, the uh, qualification to run out and start creating fitna amongst people and saying that this is haram and you're misguided, you're misguiding people. And I find that that's probably the most insulting thing that people have said to, to myself and to us um, is that you guys are people by telling them that music is okay. And, and I find it reprehensible that, that we would look at something with such a narrow lens and say that, it's, I it's, mean, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's so tragic. It, it, it is definitely hurtful. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, by these people making these statements, they're, Rejecting an entire legacy of Sahaba yes. Tabi'un scholars, and this is the this uh, is the hurtful part, uh, uh, is that it's and, and unknowingly, you know, uh, unknowingly they're deeming these giants misguided. Yes, unknowingly they're deeming these yes. giants who came before us misguided, which brings tears to the eyes, honestly. Absolutely, yeah. and it, and and it's it's contrary to the way that the companions would respect each other in terms of differences of opinion. I mean. You never, you never see um, uh, Omar, you know, declare now be that saying, "Oh, Abu Bakr, you're kafir because you believe this and I believe this." Can you imagine? Never. Can you imagine the incredible amount of respect that they had for each other that we yeah. honestly have no idea. We're so busy focused on music being haram that we leave the basic etiquettes of what it is to be a Muslim Islam. at the front door yeah. or back door, depending which the way you're going. <laughs> Yeah. The conduct of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is forgotten in these debates. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine you, you mentioned Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar. Abu Bakr mm -hmm. preferred Khalid bin Walid as a governor, and and Umar didn't. Now imagine, based on this, Abu Bakr started calling Umar a kafir. You know, how? Yeah. How? Yeah. How? Um, incredible. Like ironic would that be? A, a, and over here, forget and then, about. And yeah. And then it, forget about sorry, the major matters based on yeah. yeah based on minor matters you're calling people kafir and misguided um and not only that it, through that you're calling the sahaba radiallahu anhum and the tabi'un and the great ulama misguided as well for their opinions yes. which yeah is definitely wrong if not yeah. for them we, there would be nothing left if if not for you know and to just um touch on is that a lot of people, they, they're they confused with the term sunnah. I, I find that, uh, that like, the, like Imam Malik, you know, in the Mu'atta, where he, he quotes hadith, and then he'll say at, at, the, at the end of it, he'll say, this is the hadith, but we don't follow it. Yeah, it's almost, he says, Lianna, yeah, he clearly, uh, that, the same with Abu Hanifa, brother Muhammad, the same mm -hmm. thing. You, you look at the hadith collection of Imam Abu Hanifa, the reason why they, mm -hmm. they say this is, they, you know, they say things like, لِأَنَّنَا رَأَيْنَا أَنَّ الْعَمَلَ يُخَالِفُهُ We saw that the practice of the companions, the practice of the tabi'un, yes. the practice of the giants, uh, it go, they go against this hadith. And hence, we, mm -hmm. uh, with, all, you know, with all respect, but we would reject this hadith based on practice. Because Absolutely. a hadith could be misunderstood, a hadith could have been said in a spe specific context. And that is why Imam Malik says something very beautiful. Uh, he says that wahidan an wahidin yanza'uka an din that this one on one narration at times it will take you out of the deen you know yes. mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. and the, and that he prefers the people of medina prefer the mass transmission from people to people because that that in it i mean that or wave to wave the, is, the better term yeah. would be wave wave to wave yeah, yeah. Yeah. exactly which is far more than just people <laughs> the wave that, that's yeah. something huge Shows the actual because I, I never, I never hear you say the word sunnah. It's always living tradition. Yes, yes. And that's the beautiful thing is that yeah. it is a. No, living even tradition. if I say sunnah, uh, then I say I, I translate it to the living tradition. That's how yes. I translate mm -hmm. it because it's far mm -hmm. better to understand for for. It's an easier, people. yeah. Because you ha way. you have to understand, brother Muhammad, the uh, Hanafis and the Malikis, who, who are the earliest, most. Um, the earliest, most genuine uh, representation of Islamic scholarship, they have even a difference in the definition of hadith and sunnah. You know, they yes. they have they have differences in the uh, the definitions of hadith and sunnah, and that is why we translate the sunnah 
to be the living tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu mm-hmm. Alaihi Wasallam. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And yeah, yeah based on this living tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, many Sahaba did not understood, uh, you know, did not understand music to be haram. Uh, mm-hmm. At one occasion, Hassan bin Thabit, who was the poet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gathered together with, um, I believe it was, yeah, it was Zaid bin Thabit. The one who wrote the Quran, imagine Zaid bin Quran. Thabit, mm. the one who wrote the Quran, the scribe of the Quran, right? Mm-hmm. Zaid bin Thabit invited a, a group of Sahaba from Mecca and Medina uh, for a, you know a small reception, and he also invited a, a young woman to sing, and this woman she brought about a flute with her, and while playing the flute, she was singing the poetry of Hassan bin Thabit, who was the you know, Sha'iru Rasulillah, the poet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in turn, out of emotion, Hassan, when hearing his poetry, he cried. <laughs> Amazing mm-hmm. how they just mellowed down and had a moment mm-hmm. to just show their emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, Amr bin al-As, the, the one who conquered Misr, the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, you know, the Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What happened? We lost you. Mm-hmm. Do you hear me? Oh, Do you hear we me? hear you. Yes, you're back. Yes, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, at one occasion, these two giants also gathered together uh, by the you know young companion, uh, Abdullah bin Ja'far. And Abdullah bin Ja'far um, invited some people to, over to play music. Um, and what ended up happening is Muawiyah radiallahu an, the one who wrote the Quran, the scribe of the Prophet, the cousin of the Prophet, Amirul Mu'minin, mm-hmm. he started laughing and smiling. And you know, he mentioned, <clears throat> he eloquently mentioned the following, Inna al-karima la tarub. Indeed, the honorable person is enjoying himself with this music. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is either referring to himself or Abdullah bin Ja'far or Amr bin al-As. That, you know, the honorable people, the people who follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're enjoying ourselves with music. Mm-hmm. So imagine how like <laughs> yeah. common of a thing this this was among the Sahaba. And it's mentioned that this same companion, Abdullah bin Ja'far, uh, he had a collection of flutes. Mm-hmm. He had a collection of musical instruments. Wow. And you know, we uh, earlier we mentioned the story of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, where he covered his ears. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This same Ibn Umar once upon a time visited um Abdullah bin Ja'far, and he saw a harp, right? It, uh, a musical instrument from Syria, just laying beside Abdullah bin, bin Ja'far. And he asked that, you know, what is this? Mm-hmm. So uh, Abdullah, bin, uh, Abdullah bin Ja'far, uh, Abdullah bin Ja'far basically said that, oh, this is, this is a musical instrument from Syria. So uh, Abdullah bin Umar, the great son of, you know, the son of the great Khalifa, Umar bin Khattab, mm-hmm. who, who, who made amazements happen in this world. Mm-hmm. And of course, the great companion of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mm-hmm. what did he do? He picked up this harp and he said that, uh, wow, you know, amazing. This brings balance to the intellects of human beings. Wow. <laughs> That's this is what he said. Harps are so relaxing to listen to. They're very, yeah. yeah very this calming. harp brings, this harp, harp, so this is what he said. This harp brings uh, a sense of relaxation yeah. to the minds of people. Yeah, it What's does. interesting, what's interesting yeah, on, on that is that the harp is always used in biblical reference, references by the angels as being that sweet. Yes, that's term, true. Uh, yeah, that's true, actually. That it would be that yeah. instrument of all. Yeah, yeah that's true. And, and that is why they, they took it sort of from a biblical uh, source, like a geographical, ge- geographically biblical source. Syria at that time right. was pre- predominantly Christian, yeah. right? Yeah, you're right. So they took it from that and then they played with it. You know, they, they loved it. They enjoyed it. Amazing. And mm. Brother Muhammad and Sister Sana, wallahi, I can go on to mention tons of other Sahaba, but mm-hmm. <laughs> just for the sake of preventing boredom, <laughs> I'm not going to do so. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll probably make a YouTube video about it uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, separately. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what, what I'll briefly mention is, you know, some people, they come about and say, oh, all the four madhabs, they don't allow music, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They say this. Imam, Imam Malik, 
the great Imam of Medina himself is reported to have gone into gatherings where not only music was playing, rather there was dancing going on among the people there. So what did he do? Rather than just sitting down, you know, with a puggery like an imam on his head. <laughs> Brother Muhammad loves to rock. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. But... Yeah, we used to rock the puggery back in the days, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so rather than just uh, sitting down, what, what he ended up doing is he took a drum that was present there and he started singing and dancing. Wow. Imam Malik. Wow. The one who narrated the muwatta, mm. you know, the one who was who would cry in his salah. Wow, right? subhanAllah. This, uh, and Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he prevented selling the uh, selling haram items. Mm -hmm. But ironically, he allowed selling musical instruments, wow. which implies that, you know, which implies that musical instruments were not haram according to Imam Abu Hanifa. As because well. if, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, he never, there, there was no... Um, fatwa from Imam Abu Hanifa no, saying no, music is nothing haram. Music. So it wasn't even. It didn't. It seems like it wasn't even an, an issue. Yeah, yeah. To not come out and no, say something. No, no, so... uh, you know, nothing at all. In fact, uh, other Hanafi muftis uh, they say otherwise that music is completely allowed. For example, the Grand Mufti of Damascus, um, the you know the great Hanafi Mufti Allama Kasani has allowed certain mu musical instruments mm -hmm. and he's seen as an authority in Hanafi fiqh. Kasani mm -hmm. is seen as an authority in Hanafi fiqh and he's allowed musical instruments. Let me mention to you, you know, one final alim and this person is, his taqwa resonates with me. Like I, I cry when I read the story of this man. Uh, the, and this individual, uh, he is a Shafi'i Mufti by the name of Al-Iz bin Abdis Salam. A great man, you know. In his time, he he faced a lot of challenges. Let me just let me just give you a glimpse of this man's taqwa. You mm -hmm. know, this man's connection with Allah. In his time, the Sultan, the king, uh, basically allowed for Muslims, Muslim businessmen, to sell weapons to the enemy combatants at that time. The the Christians who were fighting uh, the Muslims. Just to, once again, just for people to make a quick buck, right? Mm -hmm. So when Al-Iz bin Abdul Salam heard about this, he said, you know, I am giving you an open fatwa that whatever the king said is haram. Yeah. You, cannot, you cannot sell these weapons to Christians who in turn, or I'm not, once again, I'm not hating on Christians. I'm yeah. talking about yes. the Christians at that time who were enemy combatants of the Muslims. These Christians were use, utilizing these weapons to kill innocent Muslims. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm going to I give you an open fatwa, my friends, that, you know, selling uh, these weapons to these enemy combatants is, is haram. Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm going to do from now on? I am not going to make dua for Sultan Ismail in my khutbah anymore. Mm. This is what he said. Mm -hmm. When the Sultan heard about this, he persecuted the Imam, Iz, Iz bin Abdul Salam. You know, he persecuted him. And he said that you cannot give khutbahs anymore. He said, fine, I'm not going to give khutbahs anymore, but my fatwa stands. You cannot sell weapons to people who are going to kill you know, your, in your, your innocent Muslim brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. This same scholar, brother Muhammad and sister Sana is asked about music now. Oh, uh, and, and you you know what, the, you know what this person was was called. You know what his title was. His his nickname was Sultanul Ulama, the King of Scholars. Mm. The Shafi'i mm. Mufti was called the the King of Scholars. Somebody mm. came to him, and this is written in his fatawa, by the way. And they asked, "What do you think about uh, musical instruments?" So he said, "I have, I have no problems with any musical instrument." I have no problems with any musical instrument. Go enjoy yourself. This is what he said. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you know, my message to Muslims is, look, stop throwing these slurs around. Stop naively using the word haram. You know, people like Abu Hanifa, Malik, like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and Umar, they would shiver before they would say the word haram. Yeah, right? yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. Haram is what Allah made. Haram yeah. is what Allah made haram. And halal is what Allah made haram. Mm -hmm. And like I say always, go back. You know, Imam Malik, you know, we, we quoted Imam Malik much in this podcast. Imam Malik, some, he, he said something very, very beautiful. He said that the final portion of this ummah, they will not be rectified 
accept what rectified the first portion of the ummah. So Absolutely. my appeal to the Muslims is go back to the blessed first generation and you will find mm -hmm. the, the blessed first generation to be the most rational of people, the most mm -hmm. amazing of people, the most God conscious of, of people and people who promoted love rather than hate. Absolutely. And they, they were people who took Islam, Muslims, from strength to strength. And today, because of the barakah of these individuals, we are Muslim today. Mm. Alhamdulillah. 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 And with yeah. that, I know I, I'll just note before we before we end, uh, it's firstly, I want to thank you for, for taking mm -hmm. the time out thank to you spend so with much. us. I know you're busy and um, you have your family and everything. So again, much, much love for, for doing this and, and giving clarity to mm -hmm. so many people. And, um, Sorry and, once again, Brother Muhammad and Sister Sana, if I got you bored with all these no, names. Not at all. But no, once no. again, it is I as Brother Muhammad. Again. Yeah, I want to listen to it again. as Brother Muhammad. Yeah, as Brother Muhammad said, it's just to make a point at the yes. end of the day, because yes. unfortunately, Muslims in, in general have really have really become, forgive me for saying this, uh, dumb in the way they present themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Once again, no offense to anyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I think that on that note, that the people whom you've mentioned, um, whether it be Malik, whether it be Imam Abu Hanifa, whether it be the companions, this is who is referred to when the term Salaf is used. Mm. We are not talking yes. about the scholars from 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's a, a, such a ridiculous misconception <laughs> that people have is that when they say, I follow the Salaf. No, you don't. Or for that matter, we're not even talking about Shafi'i and Ahmed, who the, are the crowns exactly, of our head. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I think uh, I think we need to definitely revisit our understanding of of who the Salaf are, who they were, and and the message that they brought, and and the difference of how we perceive Islam to be today versus what Islam was to those people at that time. Because yes. as you've just mentioned, that 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 is what will fix things today. It's mm -hmm. not us deviating from the the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, and his companions so, and, and the great scholars of the past. Mm -hmm. So again, I want to thank you so much for coming on. We thank absolutely you. love Much love talk. to both of you. Um, Jazakumullah khairan for having me on. It's always a pleasure and inshallah, uh, many more blessed sessions, hopefully, if you permit, many absolutely. more blessed inshallah, sessions to come to you. And to, anybody that it, and to anybody that is listening to this podcast and you've made it this far, you are obviously seriously loving everything that comes out of <laughs> out of this shake's mouth mashallah um find him on all platforms he's on instagram youtube tiktok he has a website you can contact him directly and ask him any questions that you ever have he is there he is open and he is so willing to give you the advice that you need and we will provide all of the links for his his bio and information in the description. in the show notes yeah um so again thank you so much and we will and most definitely be in touch and talk to you soon inshallah well, if you've made it this far, you must be really bored. Like, do you seriously have nothing better to do than to listen to us talk? Haha, ha, just kidding, guys. You know we love and appreciate every single one of you. And if you did enjoy this episode, why not subscribe for more Sali Family Nonsense? And if you really want to show us some love, drop a comment on whatever platform you use to stream podcast. Even if it's just one word, it goes a long way. Thank you so much for being a part of this Sali Family of ours. Stay tuned for new episodes airing every single Monday. We'll chat again soon. Jazakumullahu khairan once again for watching. If you've benefited from this video, make sure you hit that like button, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel, visit our website, stay connected with us on social media. Your kindness and love are much appreciated. Remember us in your du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.